Leonardo da Vinci has long been known as one of the world's great artists and scientists. But many don't know he was a misfit whose outsider status shaped his work. Author Walter Isaacson spent years combing through da Vinci's notebooks. He examines the artist's life in his new book, Leonardo da Vinci. We're pleased to welcome him to our studio tonight for more. It's so, such a pleasure to meet it's you. It's great to see you. Um, Thank you. What drew you to Leonardo da Vinci you in the know, first place? All the books I've done have been about very, very smart people. But after a while, you learn smart people are a dime a dozen. It, they don't amount to much. What matters is being creative. And from Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, Ben Franklin, the people I've written about, I noticed that the people have interest in everything, who are curious just about every subject. They tend to be the most creative. The ultimate of that is Leonardo da Vinci. He had an interest across multiple disciplines, as you say. Um, how long did you spend writing and researching this book? Well, I spent four or five years writing and researching it, but my whole life I've been fascinated by him. My wife studied in Florence, and so 35, 40 years ago, we used to spend time there. And that's where he was born. And uh, yeah, he was born in Vinci, hence mm -hmm. the name, but Vinci's a village right next to Florence. Mm -hmm. Age 12, he moves to Florence and becomes sort of a person who does all trades. He works in a studio and does art, but he also solders the copper ball on top of the uh, Domo, the, uh, you know, the uh, Brunelleschi's dome on the cathedral in Florence. He does pageants and plays, he does statues, he does paintings, all for this art studio run by his teacher, Verrocchio. And so he learned to do everything, because Florence at the time was sort of bubbling with creativity of people who did everything. Now, it's interesting, his life itself, he was what you would call an illegitimate child, right? He was so lucky to be born out of wedlock, because had he been otherwise, he would have had to be a notary, like his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. But this way, he was able to pursue yeah. his own interests. Yeah, he could pursue his own interests, yeah. and he wasn't sent to a formal school, so he became what he called a disciple of experience. And every week, he would list the questions he wanted answered, like why is the sky blue, or why does water form a spiral when it ripples past a rock in a stream? Those type of things you and I, Nan, we thought about when we were 10, mm -hmm. but then we outgrow our wonder years and we quit questioning things like that. Like the, the tongue of the woodpecker. The tongue saying. of the woodpecker. At one point in his notebook, he writes down, describe the tongue of the woodpecker. How many people think about yeah. that? And, and how would you even do it? You'd find out what, <laughs> and try to pry open it. But there he is. He didn't need it to paint a painting. He didn't need it to create a flying machine or do the flight of birds. He needed it because he was Leonardo, curious about everything. I'm, I'm also wondering, because he described himself as a man without letters because he mm. didn't have a formal education. I'm wondering if um, part of his curiosity, this insatiable curiosity as you describe it, was because he was a person without letters and he was trying to prove something, or was he, was he just naturally curious? Well, I think he was naturally curious, but I think most kids are naturally curious, but we beat it out of them sometimes, you know? I was just coming over here, and I was walking behind a guy with his young boy who was saying, why is this? Finally, the man said, you know, quit asking so many dumb questions. And, you know, one lesson of my book is there are no dumb questions, and we should make sure that our kids and even ourselves keep asking questions like that. And you also say we shouldn't, we shouldn't say that Leonardo was inhuman, because he is. And was superhuman. We, was superhuman. I mean, he was, he was not like Einstein, who I wrote a biography of. And Einstein had a mental processing power that you and I and most of your listeners will never, ever be able to match. But Leonardo had a very human creativity. And it came from that observation, curiosity, having an imagination, blurring fantasy with reality. And was he um, kind of an outsider? He was definitely an outsider, as we said. He was illegitimate, he was gay, he was left-handed, he was vegetarian, he was a bit of a heretic. He had all these things that would sort of make him what Steve Jobs would call, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square mm. holes. But in Florence, he was totally embraced, you know, because it was a very tolerant, live and let live town back then, you know, run by the, the Medici family. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the secret of being a cradle of creativity. I wanted to ask you about um, this young person that comes into his life. Uh, is it Saleh? Is that how you say his Saleh, name? Saleh. Saleh. Yeah, um, um, so who was Saleh? Well, his first major companion, because Leonardo was gay, and he was also quite comfortable with the fact, unlike Michelangelo, who was there at the time and was gay 
and you know never foot was comfortable and sort of agonized about it. Leonardo had a very uh, charming but devilish. Salai means the little devil or the little scamp. And for many years, 30, 40 years, he's the main companion in Leonardo's life. And, you know, we even see the shopping list. We see what he ate. We have, of course, beautiful drawings of And he Salai. kept all that stuff in his notebooks. Leonardo, we get to look at more than 7,200 pages of his notebooks that are still around, which is awesome because, frankly, your tweets and my Facebook posts, They're going to disappear. yeah, five years from now they'll be gone, or 50 years, certainly 500 years. And so by looking through his notebooks, you can see him doing swirls of water, curls of hair, a doodle of salai. He liked friend. curls, right? Oh, he loved it. In fact, <laughs> I mean, he loved me. <laughs> and you know, he would love you. One of the things I've done after re doing Leonardo is I just try to be a tiny bit more like him. What he loved, if I may say this, yes. is how light hits curly hair and there's a spot of luster at each point of the curl. That means a shiny, a sort of a glint, mm -hmm. not just light, but what Leonardo called luster. If you look, at Salvador Mundi and his curls, there's glint. If you look at his earliest paintings, Ginevra da Benci, you see the curls and you see how light plays with curls. So I'll have everybody <laughs> looking at your hair now because Leonardo would have loved to have painted it. Wrong time for me to be in. But I wanted to bring it back a little bit to Salé. So when he came into Leonardo's life, he was 10 and Leo was in his 30s. I mean, eventually they become lovers. Yeah, companions. Companions. Yeah. Was this uh, an ac acceptable thing at the time? I think probably, you know, age Over 10, the there's no evidence that they were mm -hmm. in any way uh, companions. I think he was just working in Leonardo's retinue. From Leonardo's notebooks, we know that it was in his late teens that there seems to be a relationship forming. But yes, being gay and having a companion in Florence in the late 1400s, was not all that unusual. In fact, the word in German for somebody who was gay or like male companions was Florenzer, meaning somebody from Florence. So it was a very tolerant town in that regard, but in many other regards of, you know, people were coming because of the fall of Constantinople, bringing math from the Arab world. And they were there in Florence inventing new types of bookkeeping that made the bankers like the Medici very, um, you know, successful. So you have people with different skills, talents, and personalities all flowing into Florence in this miraculous period, which makes it the cradle of the Renaissance. Let's talk about the technique of his art. Um, you talk about acuity perspective. Mm -hmm. um, what techniques made his art stand out? Well, when he did the outlines of a face or an object, he tended to blur it slightly because he had studied optics and he had dissected the human eye. And he knows when I'm looking at your face, it's not a sharp line because I'm seeing it from two eyes, et cetera. So if you look at the Mona Lisa or you look at St. John the Baptist or you look at St. Anne, they all have what's called somato, the blurring of lines. Mm -hmm. But one of the very interesting things and was Salvador, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to point out that we have one of your favorite paintings up right. there. Right, A Lady with an Ermine mm -hmm. is that way, one of my favorites. And you see in that one, you have the light reflecting even off the ermine, and they both have expressions on their face. But as to acuity perspective, you may know Salvador Mundi, the one that sold for $450 million a few couple of weeks ago. Yes. If you look at the blessing hand of Jesus, it's very sharp, unlike the rest of the painting. And that's because Leonardo was writing about perspective, and he has what we call, there it is right there, he has what we call acuity perspective, which means even though lines are blurred when you see objects in the real world, at a certain point near your face, there's a focal point and it's sharp. So it makes the blessing hand of Jesus in this painting look like it's coming off the panel and right at us, blessing us. And so that's the magic of Leonardo, to make on a two-dimensional panel something that looks three-dimensional and that comes out of the mystery and feels like it's touching us. And also, too, from, my, from what I got from reading the book, was that this idea of drawing from or painting from the inside out. He wanted to understand how bones worked, how muscles worked. Where did he get that perspective from? Well, because he was curious about everything. So when he's early on, he's a young kid doing St. Jerome in the wilderness. He wants to know the neck muscles, so he starts doing anatomy. He goes to dissections and does it. But being Leonardo, he doesn't just dissect the muscles and nerves and bones. 
He goes down and he does the heart and the liver, things he doesn't need to know for his painting, but he needs to know because he's Leonardo da Vinci. And how did he blend science and art together? Well, you can see it in almost every painting, whether it's Salvador Mundi and that acuity perspective. But with the Mona Lisa, for example, he knew that the center of our eyes with perspective see uh, sharp black and white better but the edges of our retina see colors and shadows. So if you look directly at the smile of the Mona Lisa, the black and white at the edges turn down a tiny bit, but the colors and shadows go up. And it means that as we have a reaction to her and her head moves, she seems to be reacting to us. And the smile is elusive and mysterious and goes on and off. That's one of a thousand ways I can talk about his optics and science and anatomy informing his art and his art informing in science. Well, the one thing that he did, like he had the Mona Lisa probably until the day he died. Yeah, right? like from 1503 to 1519. He, he has this thing where he doesn't, it's, he doesn't want to finish something, maybe in a way because he knows he can make it better. Mm -hmm. um, some people might call it procrastination. Right. Um, but he did a have- A perfect <laughs> mix of procrastination and perfectionism, <laughs> which means he didn't deliver a whole lot of paintings, maybe only 15 of them. But boy, they're good. <laughs> but what, what, do you, what do you think? Why do you think he did Sorry. that? I, I do think that he was a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I remember writing about Steve Jobs. And when he's doing the original Macintosh, he looks at the circuit board inside and says, it's ugly. And they say, well, people won't see it. It's in the closed case. He said, yes, but you will know. And they hold up shipping it until it can be beautiful inside. And I think Leonardo, you know, it made him human. A lot of people criticize him because he procrastinated. He, you know, put paintings aside like Adoration of the Magi that he couldn't perfect. Mm -hmm. But it meant that he was not a master craftsman. It meant that he was a genius. Um, and do you think, um, be, speaking of being a genius, because he did take a long time to complete certain, mm -hmm. I mean, the Mona Lisa is one of the most celebrated pieces of art. Um, do you think that being an uh, obsession, like being obsessed with something is a part of being a genius? Yeah, I think that there's so many elements to being a genius, but mainly it's creativity mm -hmm. and connecting imagination to reality. And that's what Leonardo did through his curiosity. And through his notebooks, he invented a lot of things, or he came up with concepts centuries later that helped mm -hmm. people to uh, invent different things. Do you think that he saw himself more as an inventor, as more of, of a, an engineer, an architect, than he did as a painter? Well, I start the book by the... Uh, this moment he turns 30, a very unnerving milestone. Yes. And he tries to get a um, job, and his job application at the Duke of Milan has 11 paragraphs. And the first 10 are about engineering. You know, I can make weapons of war, I can build beautiful public buildings, divert the course of rivers. Only in the 11th paragraph does he say, I can also paint as well as any person. So he liked to think of himself as both. But here's the deeper answer to that question. By the end of the book, I began to feel mm -hmm. that he didn't make that much of a distinction. Let me borrow the book for one quick yes. second. Just this very thing here. I don't know if the camera can catch mm -hmm. it. All which my is notes. All your notes. <laughs> but the fetus in the womb, right? Mm -hmm. And so I asked the curator at Windsor, mm -hmm. you know, was that a work of art or was that a work of science? Oh, that would and say. And he said, I do not think Leonardo would have made that distinction. And so by the end of the book, I'm saying every brushstroke of nature whether it's a, you know, an, an anatomy, or whether it's how a ripple forms in a pond, or it's a deluge drawing, everything in nature, they're beautiful brush strokes that are both art and science. And what are some of the firsts that he was able to accomplish? Well, I'll give you some little ones, or not little ones, but mm -hmm. like I, I told you about the swirls of water he loves. Mm -hmm. So when he's dissecting the human heart, he realizes way before anybody else, that it's not the blood pumping out of the heart into the aorta that causes the valve to open and shut, because he says that would crumple the valve. It's the swirl that it makes from going from a bigger chamber to a smaller one that spreads the membrane out. So it's this type of thing that allows him to see the patterns of nature. He does it with that aerial screw, the helicopter, which is both an invention, but also a fantasy, and it's also showing the curling pattern. And he didn't do a lot of these things by himself. There was a lot of collaboration going on. Yeah, you know, creativity is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And I you know, learned that early on, even when writing about Steve Jobs. But with Leonardo, 
We think of him doing something up in his garret like Vitruvian Man, mm -hmm. the guy in the circle in the square. But I realized when I did the chapter on that, he was working with three friends. They were doing the proportions of a human compared to the proportions of a church. They all work on it. It's just Leonardo does it much better. So he was lucky to have friends who were mathematicians and architects and anatomists and everything else. Do you think that we're missing something uh, in our society when we focus on, one, on just one discipline? Yes. And I think we not only miss something in our society, mm -hmm. we lose something for our kids when we tell them, focus, you have to specialize. You know, it's important to specialize in some ways to know engineering these days, mm -hmm. to know something about how computers work in coding. But unless you can connect the creativity to technology, you're not really going to be innovative. And I think the most innovative people I know, from Leonardo to Ben Franklin to Steve Jobs to Jeff Bezos, they're curious about everything. And they're sort of excited by all the patterns of nature. So before we tell ourselves specialize and silo and learn deep in certain fields of information, we should understand the beauty of seeing the patterns that go across all of creation. Throughout Leonardo's uh, life, he had a series of patrons, uh, people who supported his work. Um, I found it interesting that towards the end of his life, he found a patron who was much younger than he was. Mm -hmm. Do you think that throughout his life, he was looking for a, pater a paternalistic figure because yeah. he didn't grow with his father, even yeah. though his father was around? Yeah, uh, Freud writes about this, does a piece on Leonardo yeah. da Vinci. And indeed, he had a very strong, powerful father but he was the illegitimate child, and his father never made him the heir. And he disappoints his father a few times by not finishing paintings, for example, that his father had served as the notary for the contract. And so throughout his life, we see a pattern that he works you know, for the Medici family. Then he goes to Milan with that job application letter you know, for the Duke of Milan. He even works for Caesar Borgia, who's a really, really bad warlord, mm -hmm. but he's a strong figure. And at the end of the, his life, he finds, you know, the perfect uh, patron, mm -hmm. uh, Francis I of France. And he takes the Mona Lisa and three or four other paintings he's working on, goes across the Alps, and is able to die in a wonderful manor house next to the castle of the King of France. Now, this latest painting that has sold for a $450 million U.S. According to Christie's Auction House, that's, a, that's the highest price ever paid for a piece of art sold at auction. Why is his legacy so enduring? You know, this shows how enduring and alluring his mm -hmm. legacy is. I spoke about the blessing hand of Jesus in that painting. It comes out from a mystical, mysterious background and almost feels like it's touching us. Mm -hmm. I think that's a metaphor for Leonardo da Vinci because out of the mists of time and even the mysteries that surround parts of his life, every now and then we can see with real clarity, with acuity, the hand of Leonardo coming out from the midst of time and feeling like he understands our emotions. He touches us. And what do you think he was in search of? I think he was in search of the most fundamental thing you can care about in life, which is understanding creation and how we fit into it. And whether it's Vitruvian man standing in the earth and in the universe and in the pattern of a church, saying, how do I fit in with that intense stare? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a self-portrait. Or the Mona Lisa with the rivers of time curling into her. Every pursuit he had was to understand everything that was possibly knowable about creation, including how we fit in. Do you think he found it? Towards no, no. Point? I think even at the end, he's still doing his deluge drawings. He's still scribbling in the notebook, tell me, tell me, yeah. was anything ever accomplished? But I think the pursuit of that, that very noble pursuit, is not something you ever achieve. It's something you just seek. And on his very last notebook page, he was always interested in the mathematical problem of squaring the circle, which mm -hmm. means transforming the square. 169 times he did. Yes, yes. And you know, trying to make a square the exact same size as a circle using only a ruler and a protractor. You can look up why that's a complicated problem. But there he is on his last notebook page, still doing ways with right triangles to transform shapes. And the last line is, after he tries to explain what he's doing, he says, but the soup is getting cold. <laughs> so you can see 
He's just always on that quest. What do you think he would make of all, you know, the admiration that we have for him? I think he would like it. You know, he was not a shy person. Mm -hmm. He quite liked the fact that, especially in Florence, Milan, and then later in France, people would come visit. They'd watch him paint. They would look at his you anatomy like drawings. Yeah, yeah he, uh, Michelangelo, his sort of rival at the time, was very reclusive. But Leonardo was very public as a figure. And this is being turned into a movie? Uh, it's been bought by Leonardo DiCaprio. I know very little about Hollywood. I'm a big admirer of Leonardo DiCaprio, but I have, you know, I'll wait and see, and I hope it'll be good, because Leonardo DiCaprio cares about nature, cares about the environment, cares about science, loves performance art, which is what Leonardo started off doing, and, of course, loves painting. So I think he's the right person to do it. I mean, it should be seen by everybody because it's such, it, reads, it really reads like a screenplay. It's fantastic. Well, all good lives read <laughs> like screenplays. Well, thank you so much, Walter thank Isaacson. You, really it's been a pleasure. It. It's my honor to meet you. Mm -hmm. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.